Sleepwell has no noise, but if you keep, if, you, if the Sleepwell has noise and you crank up tau D, you'll see something that looks a lot different than that. So the main things to really, I'm not as concerned about that as I probably should be, but understanding these two is, is important. Okay. And this will just be something you'll understand better as we go through um, this over time. Okay, so this is a simulating example. It's different than the one that you guys have for your homework. Okay. Um, the difference is you're going to do something just like this for your homework. I think at the end of the homework it says like make a controller that controls the ratio of these two cell populations. But the difference for your system is that you're not going to have a transfer function representing the process. You're going to have an S function, right? Think of the differential equations. But still, you do it kind of like this. If you want to know exactly how to do it, someone asked me, go, remember I uploaded all those examples? There's either in a zip file. Go into that zip file and, and open up, oh, try to find one that says control or close loop or something, and find one that has a, something that looks just like this but has an S function in there, and then mimic it. Yeah. Alright, so what is this particular simulation doing here? Well, it's saying, I just made this up. I just created this for fun. This is a transfer function. It represents my system dynamics, my process dynamics. I just made it up. Okay. Second order system. Fine. Whatever. Um, so to do feedback, to do control, I have to do this. The output of, this control, of the process is this signal here. I feed that back. I compare it to the set point, which I put in simulate to be a step function, subtract the two. Someone came up to me last time, they add these two. If you add these two, it'll be disaster, right? Because the, you, you need to make, this, this signal has to be the error signal. It has to be the set point minus the measurement. Otherwise, it's not going to work. The controller takes this error signal, operates on it with this PID algorithm, sends the signal that goes through the transfer function, okay? All right. So in this simple thing, you know, we're not modeling the sensor, we're not modeling the control valve and all that stuff. We'll come back to that. You can consider it all lumped here, whatever. Okay. So then I write some things to the workspace. I'm interested in the set point because I want to see how, how well the output matches the set point because that's what it's supposed to do. I'm also interested in the input okay. because that's what the controller is generating trying to make the error equal zero. So it's usually a very good idea to look at what the controller is doing to the input and make sure it's doing something reasonable. I'll show you what I mean in a minute. So I guess I could open this thing up. I'm sure I got a bunch of them. So I'll open this thing. All right, let's go there. And um, of course, I don't know what this, this, this what did I give it a name? I've been looking at the slides. I'm sure I gave this thing a name at the top of the slide, but I, I forgot to look. Okay, let's go back and look. PID example, okay. So I'm coming over here to something called PID example. That one. Just thinking. I'll show you briefly. Of course, this is quite impressively large. Um, I wonder how you change view. Zoom. What? It's just in the view. Oh, there you go. All right. So what did I do here? Well, you might imagine I went into the block. You know, when you first open up Simulink, you get all those different, you get that template that has all those blocks. And I found the ones I wanted and dropped them in here and connected them up. Okay. You've already seen the transfer function. You've already seen these things right to the workspace. You've already seen the set point. This thing, um, I'm not exactly sure where that one is. Have you, operations or something? We'll try to find out, but you know that usually works. It is true you can search for these things, but you got to know what they're called. Um, if you've never had one, you don't know what they're called. This is your theory? <laughs> yeah? This theory is really good. <laughs> there it is. You see, the, the default is plus and plus, but you can click on it and change any of these things to minus or plus, whatever you want. Okay, so I found that. Um, and the other thing was, now, one thing you have to keep in mind is that what I usually, I develop most of these examples with an older version of MATLAB. So sometimes the blocks I have won't look like the blocks you have if you have a newer version of MATLAB. And I think the PID controller is an example of that. 
Is that under continuous, maybe? There it is. The PID controller. Okay. Pick that guy, drop it in there, um, and eventually connect them all up. It looks something like this. So what am I? I'm going to simulate. I'm going to do a step change. I just want to see how this controller works. Okay. So at time five, I'm going to do a step change from zero to one. I always like to do the step change at some time after zero because I want to see a flat line, a change, and a flat line. It's kind of obsessive behavior. Part of it. All right, everyone knows how to do this, right? You just enter, drop the transfer function there, enter the numerator and denominator coefficients or whatever transfer function you might be interested in. All right, now the PID controller, at least my version, I think yours is going to look different, looks like this. Okay, now you got you to read it carefully. It says, enter expressions proportional integral derivative, and it wants you to do this. What, what does that mean? It means you, it wants you to write the controller in this form, <coughs> proportional control plus integral term plus derivative term. Okay? And so if you go back and look, I, I could write this on the board, but I happen to have it on the slide, I believe. It wants you to write the controller like this. <coughs> this is what it thinks the controller is. Proportional term plus integral term plus derivative term. It doesn't want the KC multiplying a sum of them. So in other words, when you enter the parameters, let's say you know KC, tau i, and tau d for the equation that I presented before. The KC is the same as the KC, but the KI here is the KC divided by tau i. And it just multiplied that equation out. It's not rocket science. Took the equation I gave you and just multiplied KC across. So then what it calls ki is kc divided by tau i. What it calls kd is kc times tau d. If you just enter kc, tau i, and tau d into those things, the thing's not going to work. Right? So make sure that you, but this is assuming you know guys of kc, tau i, and tau d. All right. So what did, I, what did I pick in there? What values did I choose here? Oops, that's it's not going to work out. All right, let's try again. So I've got these magical numbers, 1.5, 2.5, and 1. How do I know these are good values? Because I played around with it. Okay. And later on, I'm going to teach you how to, how to tune the controller so that you can come up with values. This is not a fun ex exercise, right? Let's say you were actually on a plane, and, and you had to find these tuning parameters. So you have to search over this three-dimensional space, and you're actually in a plant. So that means if you pick really bad values, the controller will really do something bad. And then the operations people will say, what are you doing? And you're like, tuning a controller. Okay. So they won't like you. So what we need is ways to find what values these should be without just trial and error. Right? Trial and error is not what we're <coughs> teaching you. So I, I can do it by trial and error because it's a simulation and there's no risk. And I, I have a lot of experience doing it. But I'll be teaching you soon how to pick these in some kind of systematic fashion. All right, so what, guess what I do? I, I set some time that I'm interested in simulating over. I hit that little button. Okay, let's hit the little button for get. Ding. And then you come over here. That's disappointing. Somewhere in here, there's a workspace. LS, no. You know this command, who? It comes from what that, the, the Grinch movie or whatever, right? So if you, I can, usually there's a window up there that tells you what's in the workspace, but if you type the command who, it'll tell you what variables you have. So when I ran the simulation, I created the, these variables. These are vectors. Okay. So that's all the stuff I wrote to the workspace. It automatically creates this for you, key out. I created input, output, and set point if you go back and look at the thing. And if, I think if you want more information on these, you can type the command who's. Okay. This will tell you they're all vectors. And so when you see a vector like this, means you've got 98 time points in one variable. So you have the value of the input at 98 time points. You have 98 values of time. So I, hopefully you've learned in that line where you plot these, these things better be the same dimension. Otherwise, if you do this error, like vectors aren't the same dimension. So at this point, you can do things like, no, don't do that. That's a little different. Plot, key out, um, what was it called? Output? How quickly did I forget? Too much pressure. You can see I've created something large here. 
Okay, so it looks something like this. So the green thing is the set point, right? It was zero up until time five, and then I told it to change to one, and then you can see the output responds to that. The controller is adjusting the input around to try to drive the output to this um, to, the, to the reminder. If someone said, "Do you like that?" I'd say, "No, it's it's too oscillatory." So I don't know if I should really do this because we're already way behind, but it's fun anyway. So. If I were to see that, the first thing I would try doing, we'll learn a lot more about this, is that I would say, I better make this number here smaller. I'll try one. Because that will make the controller less sensitive to the air. It may be a little bit slower, but it should be less oscillatory. I'll run this thing again. I will try to hold that plot so I don't overrun it. I'll plot. I won't bother plotting the set point because it's already plotted. And I'll plot this in a different color and I'll try red. Hopefully this all works out. Ah. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> well, guess what? <laughs> I like that even less. Okay. So you can see tuning controllers is non-trivial, and even the professor seems not to know how to do it. <laughs> so I will teach you, supposedly, how to do this better. But you get the idea, is that once you have this kind of thing set up, you can play around with what the parameters, what the fact they have. And so in an ideal situation, if you were in a plant and you could get a simple model, you would take your model into MATLAB, try to tune it in MATLAB, and then you actually implement it. You'd have a much better competency to have reasonable parameters than if you just do it by trial and error in the plan. It might be much faster also. Okay. And so if we look at the final <coughs> few slides here, they're nothing but what I've showed you for the most part. So what did I do here? I was showing <coughs> responses of the system for different controllers. So I did the set point change. Obviously, this is not exactly what I just did. This is a little bit more work. I generated what the response would be with no control. Guess what? If you don't do, if you have no control, it doesn't do anything. It just stays where it was. Okay? It doesn't follow the set point at all. If you have PI only, it's that red one. How did I make it PI only? I set that KI and KD to zero. I set that KI and KD to zero. It's just proportional control. The um, what is that? Magenta. Color is the PI controller to oscillatory, and then the green one is the PID, which is much better. Okay. All right, so this is the kind of thing that we can do, and this probably shows the inputs over here. Okay. So usually when you do control, you don't only want to look at the output, you know, how the output tracks the set point, but what input is, is the controller generating to achieve this? <coughs> so if you look at the green one, you see the green line? If you notice the green line seems to go off the chart, it's because it does, because the green line has a derivative term, which I didn't try to change. It has derivative of the error, I changed the set point like a step, so the derivative generates a huge initial value. I didn't plot it because it makes all these other things look like flat lines. It goes up to maybe a thousand or hundred, I don't remember. Okay. But you can see if the if the response is oscillatory, um, if the output response is oscillatory, the input response is oscillatory. And even though I didn't put it in this simulation, you might have a case where these inputs have limits. You know, like certainly the, I'm sure the green would exceed any reasonable limit. But the, the moral of the story here is that it's usually a good idea to look at the input because this isn't the best example, but let's say that you did the following. You built a controller, and you, you like it a lot. And the reason you like it a lot is because you do a set point change, the output does this. <coughs> like it gets there really quickly. Okay? You think, well, this is awesome. But what you forgot is to look at the input. And when you, the input does this. Slam the valve closed, slam the valve shut, and then, then, then finish the job. This will not be acceptable. You understand? Even though the output looks good, this is the wear out the valve. And it's disconcerting to operations people that you're slamming valves open and closed. So this is this controller is tuned too aggressively. Even though the output looks great, input is not good. So it, it's some kind of compromise. We'll talk about that. 
Alright. So, my, my misguided dream of catching up, obviously, is nothing but a dream, but that's okay. So now we'll talk about instrumentation. This should be pretty quick. This is, I have to admit, this is not the best environment to learn about instrumentation. I'll show you pictures of stuff. This is, my hope is that you get some experience from doing this in the lab, right? Because when you work in a lab, you have, there's actually instrumentation there. For many of the experiments you have, the instrumentation is kind of hidden away. So if you do like the, I haven't been in the lab in a long time, I'm not going to lie to you, but at least the heat exchange experiment has the big thing where the heat exchange is mounted. Do they still have that? It's like mounted on, are you following me here? People are like, what are you talking about? But, so a lot of the instrumentation is around the back, right? So you have the unit in the front with the valves and stuff, and then if you go around the back, you'll start to see flow meters and IDP converters and a lot of the stuff I'm talking about. So this is not the ideal place to talk about instrumentation, but I at least wanted you to get some idea, and this should be pretty quick, okay? All right, so this is another favorite example of the book. The stirred tank heater, right? This is where you put fluid in the tank, heat it up, and um, take out fluid at a hotter temperature than it was because you want to use this downstream for some other unit operation. So this represents a controller for this. So if you look at this system and someone says, what is the goal of this system? You should come up with the following answer. Heat up the fluid. What's the most important property of the fluid do you think you'd want to control? The temperature of the fluid, right? So what are you going to do then? You've got to measure the temperature of the fluid. How do you do that with a the thermal couple? You send that thing <coughs> through a transmitter, send that to the controllers compared to a set point which isn't shown, and then it drives something. In this case, it drives like an electrical heater. It might drive a valve that puts steam through a jacket or something like that. And in this case, it's a heater. Okay, and by instrumentation, I mean all the stuff that is auxiliary to the process, the sensor, the transmitter, the controller, the electrical heating element, that stuff, that's the instrumentation. Okay. I already spent all of this stuff. Okay. okay, so this is terminology. Sensor measures the thing you want to, to measure. Okay. That's kind of redundant, sorry. Um, it measures the controlled output, measures the thing you'd like to control. The transmitter transmits that and usually amplifies it give the signal to the controller. Controller operates on this, sends a signal to the final control element. This, in this case, a heating element, but usually a control element. Okay? And all this instrumentation working is critical for what we're talking about to work, even though we don't focus on this. And how'd it go? Well. Okay, good. <laughs> you hate for them to miss class and come back and say it went really badly. <laughs> right? Okay. So this stuff working is, is critical to what we're doing, and you could argue that the most critical things are this, because these things, well, this is the focus of the class. We're trying to try to make this work. Transmitters don't easily fail, but sensors and, and valves, these are the main things that have to work. And anyone that practices control in industry will tell you that your ability to control is largely limited by what you can measure. If you can't measure it, you can't control it, and some things are hard, really hard to measure. Obviously, temperature is not hard to measure. When I show you a picture like this, I, I hope you appreciate that this thermocouple is not floating around in the lake, right? You don't just hang a thermocouple in there with a, with a mixer, right? They just wrap it around there. It's, it's in a, we'll talk about this, it's a little thermal well that sits on the side of the reactor and, and contacts the fluid, usually through the material of construction of the valve. It's not just floating around. Okay. So your ability to control is going to depend on how well you can measure things and usually if your valves are working. And in this idealistic world of academia and the undergraduate curriculum, you may think this always works, but in reality, this never works. No. Okay. If you're in a plant and you ask some guy, do all your sensors and all your valves work? The answer is, of course not. Okay. Some, most of them do, most of the time. But some of them work all the time, and some, a few of them almost never work. So this is important for practical applications of control, so we at least want to touch, touch and taste on it. Okay. So these are very simple pictures. What does it say? They call this the control system process interface. So you've got a process. This means a plant. The plant's outside. It's hot. You're usually in a fairly undesirable location, including places like um, Texas and Louisiana. Okay. <laughs> you don't want to actually go out there. It's dangerous. It's hot. You have to wear flame retardant suits. You'll sweat a lot. Okay. Here's the control room over here. This is air-conditioned. They have donuts and coffee. You want to be here, okay? 
This is all the stuff that communicates between the control room and the actual plant. So there'll be measurements coming in. They'll have a big room in the control room where there's literally thousands upon thousands of wires. All the signals that are coming into the control room, all the signals that you're sending back out. So these are the measurements coming in. These are the actuating signals you're sending out, signals, electrical signals that drive control valves. Okay? That's idealistic. A real plant looks like this. Okay? Lots of measurements, lots of actuation. Usually there's a lot more measurements coming into a control room than you actually use for control. Because they measure lots of things. And the reason you measure lots of things about a process that you don't use for control is because it helps you characterize how the process is working. And if something goes wrong, you can go back and look at all these measurements and see what happened. So for example, if you're making a polymer and you send it to the customer and the customer complains something was wrong, you'd like to go back in the data six weeks ago and see what might have happened that caused that campaign to fail. Okay. And so they have these things called data historians. They're just massive software databases of all measurements that were collected um, for usually six months or something like that. You can always go back and look at them. Okay? So this is the control room. So if you've ever been in a control room, uh, this is a bunch of distributed control computers, displays that show all the measurements and things they like, schematics of the plant with measurements showing what's going on. And the operators are sitting around these things making sure the controller works, <laughs> basically. The, the way things used to work is the controllers ran the, the, the operators ran the plant, right? But now that you have automated control, the operators run the control system. They don't run the plant directly yet. Systems and interface. Like flying an aircraft. Pilots don't fly airplanes. They, they put inputs to control systems that fly airplanes. Okay. And that's why they never crash almost. With a few exceptions. Okay. Alright, so this is what we're really talking at this point is this level here, the actuation and measurement is what we're interested in. Okay. So just real quick, sensor produces a physical response related, hopefully proportional, make it easier to the actual variable of interest. You never know the actual temperature, you never know, know the actual flow. You just know the measurement. You often don't know if the measurement's good, right? Because if, it's, if it says 10 liters per minute, it said that for the last 10 years, that's what you think it is. It, it could be 15 if the thing is in air. Okay. So for example, thermocouple takes temperature and creates a millivolt signal that's proportional to temperature. The transmitter converts this to a signal, usually amplifies this, so it will take the temperature measurement millivolts and, and amplify that Oops. to a um, voltage signal. Transducer is something that converts one signal to another. The only one we're usually really concerned with is I to P, right? That's, that's a device that takes an electrical signal from a controller and creates a pneumatic signal that drives a valve. And the units of these things are really bizarre. So if you look, analog signals mean you know, voltage and current signals, pneumatic mean air pressure signals. These are the typical ranges for historical reasons. Okay. So something's in milliamps, it's 4 to 20 milliamps, and its volt is 1 to 5, and its pressure is 3 to 15 PSIG. So in other words, if you have a valve driven by pressure, and you apply 3 PSIG, the valve will be completely open. If you apply 15, it might be completely closed. Okay. Just, just the way it works, why do keep doing that? All right, so, and again, the key things here are your ability to measure and your ability to actuate. Okay. So these are the things that you take into account when you pick a sensor. So let's say you're in a plant. Again, when, when you're doing control in a plant, there's two possibilities. One is that it's a brand new plant and you're just doing everything from scratch. It's just been built. Grassroots project, they call it. Or you might be doing an improvement project, and you, you tell someone, if we just had the composition of this intermediate stream, we could do this, and it would be great. So then you have to, I told you this before, you have to justify the cost, but if you can do that, eventually you have to pick a sensor. Okay. So these are the kind of things you'll be worried about. What range does it measure? Right. So you want a sensor that covers the, the range of interest, but not a huge range beyond the level of interest. So if you had temperatures that, that went from like 200 to 250, then you might want a sensor that maybe is 200 to 400. <coughs> if you, the temperature was within 10 degrees all the time, you wouldn't go a sensor 0 to 1,000, and then it's always 500 to 510, right? Because there's no resolution there. So pick a sensor that covers the range, but not like way beyond the range. You're interested in the performance. How accurate is it? How repeatable is it? How quickly does it respond? Okay. 
So ideally, someone would be very accurate, repeatable, and it would respond really quickly. That's a good sensor. Okay. Things that are hard to measure don't <coughs> have this property. Like composition, you can't do it fast, usually, because you have to sample and you have to analyze. Um, how likely is it that your sensor will fail? Okay. So measurements of temperatures, flows, and so on tend not to fail very much, pressure. But temperatures of composition and advanced technologies Let's say you're, measure, you're making a polymer. They have spectroscopic methods that you can look at the polymer and, and get things like molecular weight of the polymer in situ, you know, like in the reactor. Sounds incredible, right? It is. Chance of failure, high. Right? Chance of a thermocouple failing, low. Okay. So what you don't want is a controller tied to a sensor that's got a high chance of failure. Like, let's say you have an exothermic chemical reactor. You're going to control the temperature. That temperature thermocouple better not fail. If it does, the reactor might explode. Okay. So what do you do then? You usually do redundant sensors. You'll have like three thermocouples, and you average them. If one fails, you just take it out of commission and average the other two, which is really critical. OK, material of construction. Like, is it something that won't be corroded or, you know, so like stainless steel is common. It's expensive. but. It will be compatible with most things eventually. So is it really acidic? Is it really basic? High temperature, high pressure, things like this. How much experience do you have? So people don't like new things. You guys are young, you like new things. Once you get to be about 35, your interest in new things will begin to erode. And once you're 45, you'll like nothing new at all. all right? <laughs> so if you're in a plant and you've been working in the plant 20 years, and someone says, how would you like a new spectroscopic method that will measure the polymer molecular weight? You're like, not really. Okay. Well, will I have to learn about this thing? Yes. Oh, okay. So people are comfortable with things they know, and once they've used something a lot, they like it. So it's a big, it's a big effort to get ex um, experienced engineers and operators to try something new. It's not, it's not easy. Safety. Right, I already mentioned this. Is it, if the sensor fails, is it going to have a big impact on the safety of the process? If you can have sensors that are likely failed tied to critical safety attributes in the process, because that would be a disaster. Invasive, non-invasive, that means is the probe going to sit in the flu like fluid itself or is it going to be, are you going to shine a laser through it? That would be non-invasive. Okay. And cost, <laughs> that should be number one, arguably. How much does it cost? All this stuff is really expensive. Even the laboratory stuff is expensive. You go in the lab, like, I don't know what a thermocouple costs, and we're not talking about valves, but about, even a little valve is $1,000. Okay. So all this instrumentation is, is quite expensive. And um, you have to justify the cost of anything that you do. Okay, here's common things. We'll go through this quickly because this is best seen in the lab. These are the kind of more common measurements that you're going to see and the techniques to use them. So these, these three are, sorry, that would be four. These are by far the most common measurements. Temperature, flow, pressure, level. Okay. <coughs> they're everywhere. And they're, why are they everywhere? Because they're relatively cheap and they're really reliable. <coughs> And so those are good measurements to have. And so people tend to just throw a thermocouple and flow meters on every stream, almost every stream on the, in the plant, because it's cheap to do, and um, it works really well. Okay. These are different technologies that you can read it. I won't bother talking about what they are or talk about the principles behind them, because I don't even know the principles behind some of these, to be honest. But this is what we're going to typically measure and control. This is the lowest level of measurement and control. Temperature, flow, pressure, level. Then you might get to a higher level, which is like we want to be able to control composition. So you have a distillation column. What, the top of one column feeds another column, and you, you would rightfully think, if I have a measurement of the composition coming out the top of the first column, that'll be really useful for operating in the second column. You will know what's coming to the second column to speed. How are you going to do that? Well, you're going to usually use GC, and I've already talked about GC. You have to take a sample from the stream, bring it to the GC, take five minutes to sample it. So, and the GC will fail, and if it, even if it works, it's slow. So these compositions are a lot less common, and they're the ones that really require a lot of justification. You don't have to justify why you measure the temperature of a stream, usually, but if you want to measure composition, you do. Anymore, you get um, these, sense, these things that are integrated. So I think this is a flow meter, and so now it's common that you'll have a flow, if you have a flow meter, it'll simultaneously measure temperature, flow, and other properties. So you get sensors that measure more than one attribute at a time. This table in the book, assuming it's organized the same as when I did this <coughs> lecture, has a bunch of different technologies you can describe.
So again, this is something you should see in a lab, and this is why if you think about going into industry, it's a really good idea to have like an inter internship, because this is the kind of thing you'll learn in industry much better than I can teach you. Okay. So sensors have properties um, just like um, processes do. So what I'm trying to do in this slide is just tell you like what do I mean by a gain and a time <coughs> constant of a thermocouple, for example. So this is how you size a thermocouple. I told you they have this bizarre range. This is the lower limit of the thermocouple, and this is the upper limit, just for historical reasons, 4 to 20 milliamps. So when you size a thermocouple, size number, when you spec out a thermocouple, you have to determine what range, the lower and upper range should be. Okay? Like, I don't think the temperature's going to drop below 50. I don't think it's going to go above 150. <coughs> and, and therefore, you get a curve that looks, you get a uh, calibration curve that looks like this. Here's the actual temperature and here's your measurement in milliamps, right? It's a linear, it's linear, lower limit 50, upper limit 100, 50, span of 100. You can see the problem here is that if the actual temperature drops below this level, you'll never know what the temperature is, right? If it's 25 degrees, you'll think it's still 50. What <coughs> actually happened, and you might remember that, um, Remember that plant that exploded? They had a problem like this, right? If these things aren't sized right, you'll have no idea of what temperature it is below this limit and above that limit. So it has to be sized in the right range. Okay. So the gain of the um, device, the sensor, looks like this. Okay. It's the output range over the um, output range being in milliamps, because the output of the sensor is in milliamps, and the input is the actual temperature in degrees C. So all I'm doing in this equation is coming up with, a, with a, basically a calibration curve. It tells you if you have temperature in degrees C, what will your measurement be in milliamps? Okay. So how do I do that? Well, I take the gain, this thing here. This is the output range, right? It goes from 20 to 4, mil, well, 4 to 20 milliamps. That corresponds to temperature to 50 to 100. Okay. Just like I'm creating a line for that. This is not, this is not a big achievement on my part. Okay. Um, so there's, there's the slope of the line, right? That measures T, you subtract off the initial value, and then you add on 4 milliamps there. I mean, I assume everyone can come up with a line. You know, there's X, and there's Y. Okay, there's the equation for the line. Okay. So, um, I don't think I believe my equation yet. Okay. So this is just nothing but a calibration curve. So when you buy a thermocouple, you buy a, you get these from the companies, right? They'll give you plots that look like this, and you can see how uh, the valve behaves. Now in principle, the valve, the, sorry, not the valve, the thermocouple has some dynamics associated with it. In other words, if you change the actual temperature, you don't see a change <coughs> in the signal being sent for some period of time. Okay? A good sensor has really fast dynamics. Because right. let's say you're measuring the temperature of a, of a reactor, you need to know what the temperature is quickly. Right? You can't afford to have a, have a, so what is this? This is trying to depict, if we want to ascribe some dynamics to this thermocouple, I'm saying, let's say the simplest thing we could, it's first order. Okay. And the gain, that's that thing there, this thing. Maybe it also has a time constant. <coughs> it takes some time to respond. If the inlet temperature, the actual temperature changes, it takes you some amount of time to know what the measurement actually is. If this time constant is big, you're in trouble. Okay. Because if the if the your ability to measure is limited by dynamics, like usually sensors and valves need to be fast, process is slow. If if sensors slow, you're gonna be in have a lot of difficulties. Okay. So I said this, typically a good sensor will have a time constant that's a lot